people don't understand that we were in the same buildings, <clears throat> you know, every week or every month and would have the same cops that would work the matches in a lot of – in many places. Because, um, I mean, now if you go to an independent show, do they even have – do they ever have uniform police at anything but a, a WWF show, a WWE show anymore? They might have them somewhere, but usually it's just some stooges wearing a T-shirt. Yeah, I think if the building – if the building contract is that you have to have – a certain amount of legitimate security, then what you do is you hire off-duty cops, or you used to. Some places won't let you do that anymore, and they have security companies now. But generally, <clears throat> in the territory days, if it was a regular town, uh, a, a major arena like the, the you know Atlanta Omni or Charlotte Coliseum, that's how Doug Dillinger became the security guy in WCW. He was a Charlotte cop that became also a cameraman for Crockett, and then you know, ended up doing security for WCW, but the same group of cops would work the matches uh, on every week or every month. And so you got to know them and you never, I won't say never, some people I'm sure did, but you didn't really have to smarten those cops up it because once they were around the matches long enough and they're smart to be what's going on. And it's not like some goddamn Jasper, Georgia sheriff, right? Cops in Louisville, Dean Hill started that way. Um, th but the cops would kind of be smart, but not officially. But they, the heels would always make friends with them because the heels are the ones that needed them. And the baby faces wouldn't necessarily be that nice to them because they didn't have to, see? So they were always, and that was by design, Dick Byer, the destroyer. And <clears throat> when he came to Mid-South to put Mark Reagan over, the kid that he trained every, every night for a couple weeks, the first thing he would do when he got to the arena and got dressed was he would walk outside the heel locker room door and there would be the police contingent ready for the matches. And he would introduce himself. He'd go up and he'd say, how you doing guys? He'd shake their hand. He'd say, big dick hurts. He didn't tell him who he was. He's, he's, you know, having fun. He's slapping them on the back. He's talking about the local sports team or whatever. Five minutes. And all of a sudden now he's got the cops that, you know, if somebody fucks with him, they will take care of him, right? That's the classic mark of an old-time heel. That was the trick. Um, one time, I, without smarting anybody up, but in Cleveland for a Crockett show in that old downtown building where they had the riot with fucking, you know, Ox Baker and, and Ernie Ladd. Yeah, Johnny Powers. And I got whacked there one time myself, and they used to throw rocks, and I had a vas full Vaseline jar thrown at me one time out of a woman's purse. Um, batteries and everything, shoes. I'd throw the shoes under the ring. Anyway, um, I'm supposed to run in on a lumberjack match. So not only is the, and, and fuck the Terry Taylor with my racket, the baby face, not only am I the only one on the stage, everybody else on the card is around ringside. So I have to go through to the ring, but I also have to come back. Right. <laughs> so I told the fucking cops as i'm standing there watching the match i said you know i'm getting real ticked off at what's going on and i don't know whether more than two or three minutes is going to go by before i can contain myself to running down there and doing something about it <laughs> and kind of looked at him and he looked at me he said i got you because of what the fuck you know you have to right but no, under normal circumstances, you didn't smarten him up officially unless it got to be somebody that was involved with the promotion. I mean, Don Slatton, the lawman who was a, a fucking top wrestler in West Texas because he in, uh, he owned a bail bond company in Abilene. And he's the one who tried to double cross Harley for the NWA title. But, he, you know, guys that were involved in the local sheriff's department, we Willie Davis was a sheriff here in Louisville in the 60s, I'm sure in 70s. I'm sure that. You know, he told some people what was going on. But anyway, that was for the regular towns, right? So you were okay. And, I, you know, they would even, as we've talked about, the Charlotte cops and cops in different territories, they'd rib with you. And they did. They arrested me, fake arrested me in Spartanburg one night for kicking a cop when I was missed a, a guy they had tackled and pulled off of me that had hit me. And and they arrested Arn one time and put him in the back seat of the police car behind the Coliseum till he looked up and saw Flair and Tully and JJ dying laughing at him out the bay. He was handcuffed in the back seat. So that that was but then you would go to other ter different territories or spot shows or places where 
the the police not only weren't smart, but they didn't work matches often enough to get smart or to develop a rela- relationship with the guys. Um, Jimmy, Del, one night we're at Smoky Mountain Show in Eastern Kentucky somewhere, and we'd fucked the Rock and Roll Express around. And one of the cops that was walking Jimmy Del Rey and, and me and Tom back was legitimately pissed and said something to Jimmy about what the fuck. And, you know, and he, of course, Jimmy was did not tolerate fucking smart asm smart assism mildly so jimmy said something back to him and he got the point i had to pull jimmy del rey away from this cop nose to nose and i am paying this cop indirectly because the sponsors have arranged for these cops to be here and the sponsors are getting 25 percent of the gate right so i'm pay. i, I gotta pull jimmy del rey away from this fucking cop who was going to arrest jimmy for fucking the rock and roll express or the uh, uh, um, and maybe when we talk to Schultz, when you talk to Schultz, and of course he might have a different story, but Dennis Condry, to Phil Higgerson, and Dennis Condry, David Schultz, <clears throat> and uh, and um, Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson, or Ricky and Robert Gibson, I should say, the Gibson brothers, in I believe it was 1977, went to Nova Scotia when the Maritimes up there and it was a territory. I think was it Al Zank. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't uh, uh, Rene Dupree's right. uh, dad. It was the other one. Anyway, they would run seasonally wrestling up there in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, etc. And they a group of guys from Tennessee went up there. Ricky and Robert as the baby faces, um, uh, Higgerson and Condry as the heel team, and David Schultz was a heel. And then I think Leo Burke was involved. He was a great guy. Uh, but anyway, Higgerson Condry stayed, I'm, Dennis told me like six weeks. I remember I was getting the newspaper clippings because of, of these fans here in Louisville love the Gibson brothers. And I was getting all these, uh, anyway, they stayed like six weeks, maybe because one night they had got some heat on the Gibson brothers and the people surrounded the ring and weren't going to let them leave. And they goddamn, they're looking for the cops and where's the cops? And here comes the cops in uniform and started climbing the ring steps. And Dennis said one cop had his hand on his gun and was cussing him out. The cops were hot. And then what the fuck? And suddenly here comes D- David Schultz, Dr. D, because it was a hockey building, right? He's got a hockey stick. Dennis said he could see people scattering from the back because it looked like a helicopter coming through. And they dove out of the ring under Schultz's arms, and he they ran back to the back. And and Phil and Dennis, I don't Schultz may have stayed, I don't know, but Phil and Dennis got their bags, didn't change, went right out the back door in the car to the airport, and flew back to fucking Tennessee, and didn't stay the rest of the fucking loop, cause fuck it, right? And the Midnight Express, it the when when we first went to Saginaw, Michigan, because when we first went to Georgia. Uh, to work for Crockett when he had absorbed the, the the Atlanta office and was running a group out of Atlanta and a group out of Charlotte. The Atlanta office was fulfilling the contracts that Georgia Championship Wrestling had had if for the Ohio and Michigan tours, right? And you go to Saginaw, Lansing, Grand Rapids, never Detroit, but all the smaller towns in Michigan, and you go to Wheeling, West Virginia, Columbus, Ohio, Dayton, etc. <clears throat> we go to Saginaw, Michigan. And I think it was against Buzz and Brett Sawyer, and we fucked them uh, in the finish because we were brand new and they were leaving. So we go over some kind of fuck, and Dennis was in front, and I was in the middle with the racket, and Bobby was at, uh, behind because the the always in those days, the cops would walk you down the ringside aisle and to the locker room. There were no barricades down the aisle. There, it was. The, you were walking through fucking the corner of ringside, right? You remember this. Some people may not be old enough to know this. Yeah. So also, we had a rail around the ring, but it wasn't the bicycle rack or the big shit. It was like one of those one-inch around pipe metal ra- two rails, like three feet tall. Don't come in here. And it was six feet from the ring, and it was just tall enough that it was awkward to step over. So in a, in the corner in front of the aisle, they had like a two foot area where it, it was broken, so you could walk through it. Right, you could step over the bottom one and, and and bottom rail and walk through. So this is the scene that greets us when we leave the ring. We fuck the Sawyer brothers. We jump down to the floor. We've got to funnel through this two-foot wide area and step over this railing and where the cops are waiting for us. They can't even be bothered 
because they only do this once a couple times a year, whatever the fuck. They can't be bothered to come in and get us. They're waiting for us outside. We step over the deal, and the cops start walking us, and they'll get like two of them on each side of us, right? And that's the way they walk us down the aisle. As soon as Dennis steps over and I step over and Bobby's the last one to step over, a guy ran up from behind from from down the aisleway and spun around the corner and kicked football kick Bobby right in the stomach. Cause I hear the and the oof and turn around and Bobby has trapped this guy's fucking legs. The guy's on one foot, but Bobby ain't got no breath left. And what he he just turned and took the guy down on the floor, whereas I started whacking him with the racket and Dennis comes up to put the boots, this motherfucker, right? All of a sudden, somebody grabs me around the neck. I I, I fucking goddamn rear naked choke and oh fuck. And I swear to God, while I was, I was trying to swing backwards, the racket over my head to hit whoever had me because it was, it was a good firm rear naked choke. One of the cops in uniform comes up and grabs my hands and holds them together with my racket so I can't get out. <laughs> and fuck? I'm thinking, what the fuck is this guy doing, right? I didn't know the guy that had me in the choke was a cop. The cops were pulling us off the fucking guy that just fucking tackled Bobby, right? <laughs> what I didn't see until they're dragging us down the aisleway was that one of the cops had tried to grab Dennis and hammerlock him. And why would you try to grab a wrestler and hammerlock him? Dennis blocked it and fucking reversed it and almost jerked the fucking guy's arm out of his shoulder before he realized it was the cop. At which point when he lets up, the other one comes from behind and they grab him too. And they fucking drag it. Thankfully, at least the cops are dragging us down the aisle because at least none of the more of the fans are attacking us, right? <clears throat> but we get in the back and the guy's screaming at us. Because when he let me go, I said, what the fuck is the matter with you? He said, what are you doing? You just attacked that guy. I said, he just jumped on my boy there. Well, he, you shouldn't have hit him with this tennis racket. He grabs the racket away from me and throws it down. I said, what if he'd had a knife? Then we would have arrested him. I said, yeah, after Bobby's bleeding to death. And so I'm motherfucking this fucking guy. He's motherfucking me. The other cops apparently were coming to this guy's aid and not didn't really want to well at least until the fucking guy got his shoulder almost jerked out didn't really want to fucking beat us up but they're standing over in the side but you know fuck it he should have he he shouldn't have arrested me but he could have arrested me and probably the way things were going he it should have happened but here comes elliot mernick and the promoter for crockett the old mernick brothers and he gets in between because those guys we're paying them to be there to protect us but even if they wanted us to get off of the fucking guy that jumped on us, they immobilized us and drug us through an angry crowd where we couldn't defend ourselves, right? Because they, I don't know what the fuck. So after Elliot gets the cops out of the locker room, which that's another thing, the cops came in the locker room, which back then never happened, but they were so fucking mad. So all this shit's going on in front of everybody, right? So I told Elliot Mernick, I said, Elliot, I love you. I'll make Raleigh for you all the time. I will never come to this fucking town again. What, what, what? I said, no, if you can't guarantee me that the cops aren't going to fucking jump us. I know the fans could at any point and often do, but when the cops jump us, I ain't coming back. Don't book us back here. Right. And so, and I, t- I said, tell Dusty, tell anybody. So it wasn't like six weeks later, we're doing the promos for the next tour. And There it is, like Saginaw and Lansing and something else and something else, four or five days up there. And so I was, I told Elliot already the week before, I said, I'll be in the hotel because we're on the tour. So we'll be in the town. Bobby and Dennis said they'd fucking go. I said, I'll be in the goddamn hotel. Just don't expect me. I just don't want to no show you. Guess what they did? They ended up because that was the dying days of that goddamn thing anyway. They ran the first show up there, which was maybe somewhere up in. New York state somewhere up there and then canceled the four days in a row. So we all got to go because of lack of interest. We all got to go home and I've never been back to Saginaw, but I did the second promo that I did for the second show there. I said, they were so mad at us in Saginaw. The buzz and Brett Sawyer, the Sawyer brothers couldn't beat us. Even the Boston strangler could not beat me in Saginaw. 
And, uh, you know, so you never knew. The point is, with the security, 